Okay, let's go and make the first very vestibular incision so then we can have the possibility of vertically flipping the palatine flap so much so the vestibular flap we can move as much as we wish as a result. We start here not in the center of the ridge which would be here we start here and go to make an incision perpendicular to the tissues. This way we finish the intracircular areas. I'm going to execute the release cut, the release incision here. The membrane that we will use is a new resorbable membrane in resorbable magnesium that we will test with this operation. It was given to me as a gift to try it out and I'll show you how it goes. I finished the incision with the Mitch half C. I will then have to lengthen the flap. I then go to detach the palatine flap. I'm going to lift here where I take charge of the vestibular flap. I start from the drain with the small part of this periosteal. Let's start pulling to detach this area below. The fibrous tissue makes it difficult for me to detach. We have to be a bit careful not to tear off the flap which would create problems for our regeneration. I return here in the area where I have nice bone to cleave the flap. I approach the defect area. I go to look for the apical part of the defect here and also in the distal area. the vestibular area to the molar anyway. I am going open my papilla already because I know this mobilization will not be enough. I also finish this area and go to detach up to the vestibular on the 7th. If I need a discharge, I will do it here to stay on the 7th. We increase the detachment toward apical, eliminating all the soft tissue to be sure that we have eliminated all we also do a tour with a rosette inside these residual defects. a bit of palatine inside the defects. Okay, let's go unbox the membrane that I've never used, I've never seen. Let's open it. Wow, perfect. I'm within it, also the one who sells it. So uh, I'm not advertising for anyone. They gave it to me. And here we have the membrane. Take it, okay. Throw away everything else. Don't touch my table. Let's start to open it. Inside we find the second sterile package that you don't have to touch. I know you know, but I'll open it since I only have one. Let's take the membrane. Okay, very good. And let's bring it to the operation table. It's a very large membrane. Okay, let's go open it this way. Let's try not to touch it with steel because we were told by the manufacturer. The steel might compromise the slow resorption of the magnesium membrane. Okay, this is my small membrane. Now I'm going to cut it using the specific scissors provided by the manufacturer. 
I don't know what they're made of, I don't care. We should shape it to be narrower in this area so it can enter palatally above the defect and wider at what will be the vestibular area. We proceed to measure the median area between the teeth. I have 15 millimeters. I must always follow the principles of GPR. So I keep one and a half millimeters from the tooth and I will then cut at 15 millimeters. I will cut it wider on the base to go here and pinch it with a pin here. So here I need another centimeter or so and I'll go a bit wider than stale to station it with a pin here. So here I need another half centimeter or so. So in total we said 15 plus 10, 25 plus 5, 30. This membrane is long. I have to cut it here at 40. I'll mark it like this. And in the center I'll have to cut one centimeter away and make it become 15 and a half centimeters away from there and make it 15. Let's check that this is 15. Yes, perfect to cut. We bring it to 30 millimeters. Then we bend it quite sharply and maybe it's better to come from above. We arrive like this. We get here from this side. Let's cut like this. This will be the base that I will have in the vestibular area. This will be the part that will turn. To model it we use this tool and we bend it in this way. On the area that will then go above the ridge. Obviously it's too long here, I'm already starting to cut it a little bit. Then we'll evaluate it in the mouth. I remove the sharp edges that I never like. Over here. Then we go and offer it in the mouth to see if we have shaped it correctly. That's nice. I'd say perfect, except that it touches a little. I have to bend it a little bit here. We bend it a bit in this area, and I'll shorten it slightly here because it touches my tooth, and a little bit here because it's too close to the tooth collar, while the canine part looks perfect to me. Alright, let's shorten it slightly here. And in this stale part, Removing one and a half millimeters, which is what I need to separate from the tooth. Model here. This way, I cut a tiny bit more, a palatine. And I'm going to bend this area slightly. There you go. To see where we will make the incision, we feel with our fingers we are going to bump into the mandibular ramus. And that's the area where we'll start the incision, which will be horizontal and straight, about four millimeters from the keratinized. So, in this way the mucosa will turn toward the tongue, will immediately find the bony plane and will continue forward keeping at 4 millimeters up to more or less the seal of the 6th. After that we make a small 
vertical cut by only cutting the superficial mucosa, so not going to cut the underlying layers. With the Michelle, I finish cutting to full horizontal thickness. I begin to detach the area here to highlight the mandibular ramus. I insert myself underneath with the Pritchard. At this point, I have the muscle intact. You see that there's no bleeding. I have the periosteum here, but that's preventing me from going to dilate the flap more. So I go under the muscle and cut only the periosteum. And the discharge cut is made in two different planes, a very shallow one for the mucosa and a deep one for the periosteum. I have exposed the mandibular ramus from which I can take a sample. We autograph to moisten with some saline solution and then we proceed with the scraper to obtain the autograph that we need. This is the bone that we have recovered. We are going to structure with individual structures. The first structure is at the corner. It allows us to go and place the flaps correctly in relation to each other. Okay, so then we proceed with disconnected structures, taking the alveolar mucosa that before we had left apical to the mucogingival line. That is what we needed the cut to be at 4 millimeters. If we make the cut on the mucogingival line, we then risk having a descent of the flap during healing. Okay, let's mix some Creos S 1025. Now I'm going to add another one to the autograph so as to more or less have 50 50 volume. Let's see if it will pierce directly with the nails. Yes, I would say it's perfectly fine. Another small nail in this area. Yes, he punctured himself by putting in the nail, so it doesn't have much resistance in the handle. are coming away so let's go and reposition them. There you go. Let's go and place the graph.
position another one here. Voila. Let's re-argue this area that I don't want to be uplifted. I bend it like this. Let's dissect the periosteum. Here I am extending the detachment a bit and I'm going to spread the two areas that I separated at the periosteal level. suture, we start from the median papilla, because if I close the primary cut in the tooth area first, I can't close the drain anymore. I suture the median drain with a 6.0 PGA with a smaller needle because if I use that needle and that suture, sometimes I get the flap runs in the areas where the suture passes. So I've been preferring to use a softer suture for a while now and a smaller needle. Then we commit ourselves with the 4.0 nylon to seal the ridge area with mattress sutures that start at least 4 millimeters away from the cut. That's it, only the papilla between 6.0 and 7.0 remains to be stitched, which I will spare you because filming back there is just a senseless nightmare. I think it's obvious how you stitch a papilla. Following the manufacturer's instructions, we will wait for four months, then we will go to reopen and we will find the membrane absorbed, the bone regenerated and we can go and place the implants.